All right, thank you. Um, uh, we're going to try to cover some that are cases you just wouldn't normally see, obviously, the rapid fire for more basic concepts. All right, these are my disclosures. We're going to start, not, not tightly to it, but sort of starting in general kidney, uh, Doppler, and vascular flow. So take a look at this one, patient with hematuria. Sometimes the labels sort of give it away. This is the left renal vein at the area of the aorta, and then on the right side of the screen, the left renal vein to the left of the aorta. So hopefully you're getting an idea already. We see focal narrowing um, as it's crossing, and then as it's going into the IVC. And then the more proximal portion is dilated, as you can see here. Now we put on our spectral Doppler, and we've got 112 centimeters per second flow in that narrowed portion of the left renal vein. And then the more proximal portion, we're at 12.6. So this is almost a 10 to 1 ratio of the inflow to the outflow. This is a nice uh, color Doppler showing the homogeneous flow of that dilated segment here with the aliasing and the jet effect going through the more narrowed segment. So this is a pretty nice example of renal vein nutcracker. It may be the etiology for hematuria in some patients. Uh, you look for the renal vein dilatation. I tend to notice this more on the CT studies than I do on um, the ultrasound. And uh, it's gonna be a beak-like narrowing. If you get a just mild smooth tapering of the renal vein, then that's not going to be what you're looking for. It needs to be a fairly beak-like uh, pinching off of the vein. Things that might help you on uh, CT, you might see thrombus, or even on the ultrasound, thrombus in the vein, or delayed enhancement of the left kidney versus the right. But obviously, we, we wouldn't be looking for that on the ultrasound. How do we diagnose it? So use a ratio of greater than 4 to 1 of the diameters, or a ratio of the peak velocities greater than 4 to 1. If you have both ratios over 5, now you're at 100% specificity and 90% sensitivity. So those are pretty good numbers for renal vein nutcracker. Uh, some places, we don't really do this much, but you can look at the actual origin of the SMA coming off the aorta. I know Vikram Dogra uh, talks about this a lot. And if you're upright, you use a 45 degree angle. Again, the, the organs are being moved by gravity. And if they're less than 45 degree angle in the upright position, you're at 87% sensitivity for the diagnosis. I'd like to show my appreciation for uh, being asked to give this topic. It is a fabulous topic. I'm going to challenge you all to examine the, ex the assumptions that you make while you're using these techniques that we're going to talk about. These are my conflicts of interest. So we're going to talk about slow flow imaging. And in order to not define anyone or use any one manufacturer's terms, I've uh, called this microvascular flow imaging. And we're also going to talk about vessel blood flow measurement, 2D and 3D. And then if we have time, we're going to talk just a little bit about tissue perfusion quantification using contrast ultrasound. So it's February of 2018, and I'm on call Saturday, and there's a really sick patient. He had a CT with contrast five days ago, and he, he's got pancreatic cancer, he's septic, he's got liver mats, his uh, gallbladder wall was thickened then. This is what we see on the ultrasound. And a very experienced sonographer came in and said, you know, this patient's gallbladder wall is very, very thickened. He's got some ascites around the gallbladder, but I don't think it's perforated. And there's a lot of sludge and maybe some stones. And I said, wait a minute, what about this? I don't see an echogenic mucosa here. I think this gallbladder is perforated. Well, you don't see that here. He said, no, uh-uh, it's not. Well, so then we used this new toy that we'd been playing with, and um, we put on the microvascular flow imaging, and there is no flow in this wall. This wall is perforated, and the sludge is pouring out. And um, this technique allowed me to vastly increase the diagnostic confidence that I had about a perforation in this case. And so... Um, from then on, I said, okay, I've got at least one application, and, and any time a sonographer comes to me with a patient that has a possibility of acute cholecystitis, they better be putting this on, or I'm going to send them back in for that, And um, because I think it's so important. And so we, um, 
we published this article, it took us a while to get a number of cases of this, and, and I show you this article because of the term perfusion. And we're gonna examine that term, I'm not sure I would use that term today. Thankfully, it's in quotes. Um, we were invited then, uh, because of our interest, to uh, talk about microvascular flow imaging in a, uh, an invited article for radiology. I would refer you to this. We get into some of the concepts that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail. Um, but this is something that I've been thinking about for a, a really long time, and it's what is vascularity? So vascularity, so we're going to take a giant step back, right? We're just going to look at the earth. We're going to say, what is vascularity? It's moving blood in vessels or organs. And these newer techniques improve our ability to differentiate slow or stagnant flow from thrombus. So if we can't see flow, right, we know it could be stagnant flow or slow flow, or it could be thrombus. Well, this is, we can use this to... Um, I have eight transplant cases, five kidneys, two livers, and one pancreas. Let's get right into the cases. Case one, this patient was post-op day one, renal transplant. Case two, this patient's post-op day two, renal transplant. Case three, okay, so this patient had had two prior failed transplants. We're looking at a third kidney that was placed in the midline pelvis. And so these are the two images we're interpreting. And the same kidney was imaged just three months prior. Also, again, this third midline pelvic kidney. Okay, case four, this is a renal transplant undergoing percutaneous needle biopsy. Case five, this patient's about six months post-op renal transplant. Uh, we're looking at the iliac artery, anastomosis, renal vein, and then sampling RIs in the upper and lower pole. Okay, case six, a liver transplant. This patient was about a year post-op. Case seven, this patient was post-op day one, liver transplant. And the last case is a pancreas transplant. Okay, let's look at the answers. Case one, this is a subcapsular hematoma, and you can see this crescentic area along the renal margin, and it's really very isoechoic to the parenchyma. And so if you're reading quickly, you might uh, not recognize this isoechoic hematoma. You can also notice that there's some increased parenchymal resistance. Um, Akshay also showed a similar case of a subcapsular hematoma resulting in even more uh, parenchymal resistance. But we can often see these hematomas as high attenuation uh, collections on a non-contrast CT. So what's the differential for an elevated RI? The normal RI should be less than 0.8, or some sources say less than 0.7. Um, and remember, these kidneys, just like any end organ, should have continuous antegrade flow throughout the cardiac cycle. Um, so you should never have reverse diastolic flow like this. You always should have antegrade flow into the kidney. Um, so what's the differential for an elevated RI? So we saw a fluid collection or extrinsic compression uh, from uh, a fluid collection around.